Well, um, hi, I'm Matt, by the way. I, some of you guys I may have met. Um, I, I know a lot of you, but some of you I may not have met. I want to introduce myself. I'm the uh, pastor here, but um, we're in the middle of a sermon series. It's called uh, Forgive, and we could have called it Forgiveness or tried to get really tricky with it, but we, instead we made it kind of a, a real direct statement, Forgive, because that's really what God tells us to do. And we don't always like to do um, some of the things that God tells us to do because sometimes they're hard. Um, forgiving is one of those things. I really became convinced over the last year, just in conversations, um, how many folks I've had conversations with just within our four walls here of people who struggle with this idea of forgiveness. Um, people who struggle with, um, somebody really hurt me, and I don't really want to let that go. Um, and it may be a, a, a business, ex-business partner, it may be a, 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 a former spouse, it may, I mean, all, you, just, you just name it. There's a list of, of folks that may have hurt us in some really deep ways, and we don't want to forgive them. And so when God says, but I want you to forgive, it's really hard for us. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for a God who doesn't just tell us what we want to hear. He tells us what we need to hear. And when he tells us to forgive, he does that because he knows that that's the best for us. Um, before we get started this morning, I, uh, we're going um, to go through a, a variety of scriptures this morning. So if you brought your Bible with you, I hope you'll flip with me as we go through it. We always put it on the screen, so we're operating out of a common version. And in case you didn't bring a Bible with you this morning, you can always see it up here. The other thing I have not said in a while, and I like to say it every once in a while, is we always have Bibles in the back table. And we, it would be our privilege for you to borrow one or to take one. Um, so it, those are there for you to use. And you can take it, and if you want to take it with you, write notes in it, highlight it, do what you got to do, um, because that's, uh, that's just we believe, in, we believe in the truth of God's Word, and we want to lift that up to, to folks around us. Um, so uh, before we do that, I want to invite you, if you would, to pray with me, and then we'll, uh, we'll get going. God, we do, uh, we do ask this morning that you would speak. We ask that uh, your word would be heard this morning. God, I pray that you would either uh, use me or set me aside, that you would speak through me or in spite of me. Uh, but I know that the people here didn't come to hear me talk. They came to hear something from you, and we pray uh, that you would be our teacher this morning. And we pray all these things as we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. So, when Jenna, uh, she's 18 now, when Jenna was really young, she was probably three or four years old. I don't even think Ginger and I were married at that time. Uh, I was living with uh, the pastor uh, of the church where I was working, and she, she was living uh, at an apartment, and I would go over there um, and help and all those things. We may have been married. I, I don't really remember if we had just gotten married or if this was right before we were married, but Ginger was really young. I mean, Gin, Gin, well, Gin, Ginger was really young then, too. And she hasn't aged a day since then. <laughs> Thanks. Just keep laughing, honey. Just keep on laughing. That's all good. Uh, anyway, Jenna was really young, and, and I was kind of new. You know, I didn't have, I mean, I, you know, I was 28, 29 years old. Uh, had never had any kids in the house, and, and when Ginger and I got married, I had poof, two, you know, two stepdaughters, and uh, so that was kind of a tricky deal for me, and uh, w there was one time when G Ginger was at work, and so I was, I was trying on the parenting hat, you know, for Jenna, and she was, like I said, maybe four years old, something like that, and she wanted a Pop-Tart at dinner time. It was dinner time, and she had said, can I have a Pop-Tart? Um, but she said that after I had already ordered Domino's pizza for us, and Ginger was on her way home, and I said, well, you know, Jenna, it's, it's dinner time. I've already ordered pizza. You'll, you'll spoil your dinner, Right? That's, the, that's what parents are supposed to say, right? That's what I told myself. You'll spoil your dinner. No. What followed was kind of a scar-inducing fit. <laughs> I'm still sort of recovering from it uh, to this day. I think she is too, frankly. Um, she wanted a Pop-Tart. And so she, I mean, there were tears and there was screaming, you know, kind of like, you know, her teenage years. And... Uh, I love you, Jenna. Um, no, but it was this fit to end all fits. Just went nuclear on me, right? And so, and so she's just going nuts. Uh, and and I just kept saying, "No, we can't do that. Can't do that." Well, Ginger gets home, um, and I'm I'm like, "Great reinforcements. Someone who knows what they're doing, right?" And you know what she does? She starts laughing at me. She sits down on the couch next to me. She gets as low as she can so Jenna can't see her. 
And she begins to laugh at me. And she says, oh no, you got yourself into this. You're going to get yourself out of this. And so, uh, so Jenna's in her room, and, and by this time, Jenna's sitting on her windowsill, looking out over the parking lot. And she, is, she, she says these words, and if she said them once, she must have said them a dozen times. She, said, she, calls, she calls me Maddie, because she has her daddy, and then she has her, her Maddie. Uh, she sits there on the windowsill, and she looks out the window, and she says, I don't want my Maddie anymore. I want my daddy. And just this little tear. I thought, she's going to be in counseling forever, right? I just knew. I just knew. I had just, I'd messed it up, and she was totally, and, you know, just totally messed up. And, and so I don't even really know how it ended. I just know that I think eventually, you know, there was crying, and there were all this crazy stuff, and I kept trying to, you know, be be forceful. I'm not very good at being very forceful, you know, and, and I think Ginger probably eventually came in and saved the day. I don't really know. But what I know is, is that Jenna did not want to eat pizza. She wanted to have a Pop-Tart. And that's what she wanted, and that's, she knew what she wanted, and she wanted what she wanted when she wanted what she wanted, right? And, but she, what she needed was somebody to tell her, not what she, the, yes to what she wanted, but to tell her what she needed, right? I still think, still convinced, Jenna, that the pizza, although not much better for you than a Pop-Tart, <laughs> was better for you than a Pop-Tart. And that was what you needed to hear, uh, even though it wasn't what you wanted to hear. And I, I don't know about you, but again, I'm really glad that we serve a God who tells us not what we want to hear, but he tells us what we need to hear. And so, uh, you know, these last few weeks, we've, we've been talking about forgiveness and what it means to forgive and what it doesn't mean to forgive. And so the first, the first week, Michael uh, did a great job in bringing God's word, and he, he talked about two different myths. The first myth was that forgiveness uh, is the same thing as condoning. You know, he, he, he attacked that hard, and he said, look, forgiveness does not mean condoning. When you forgive someone, you're not saying that what they did to hurt you was okay. So he talked about that. And then he also talked about a second myth, that forgiveness means that we have to forget And that's not biblical forgiveness either. The scriptures tell us that God is the one who can put our sins as far away as the east is from the west. He's the one that can forget our sins and remember them, forgive our sins and remember them no more. He's the one that can do that. We can't do that. Okay, we don't we don't have to forget and we don't have to condone in order to forgive. Last week I I was here to talk about um, dealing with the myth that we need to feel ready to forgive in order to do it. And what I said was, um, and what I think the scriptures teach is, if you're waiting to feel like it, you're never going to do it. If you're waiting to just one day wake up and say, wow, you know what, what they did was just not that big of a deal, I just feel like forgiving them, you know, that's never going to happen. I've never met anyone who's done that, maybe you're the exception, but not many people do that. What the scriptures teach us is that we are to love our enemies. What the scripture teaches us is that we are to do good for those who hurt us. So, you know, we talked about Paul saying that, uh, that if your enemy uh, if, if your enemy is hungry, you give them food. If your enemy is thirsty, you give them something to drink. And part of the reason he says that is because it, it, we are, we're told to basically lead our feelings. We don't wait to feel it in order to do it. We do it, and then we hope that eventually our feelings will kind of come along with that. But we don't have to feel ready to forgive in order to do it. Today, we're going to deal with a, basically a fourth, a fourth myth. And the fourth myth today we're dealing with is, um, is that choosing not to forgive has no effect on me. So that's the myth that we're going to tackle today. Choosing not to forgive has no effect on me. And that's just, it's just not true. On the face of it, it's not true. I mean, before we even have to crack open the scriptures, we can tell that's not true. You can ask any uh, any behavioral scientist in the world, and they can tell you uh, just from studies that basically when we have unresolved anger, what it creates in us is a fight or flight response. What it does is it makes us uh, it, it raises our blood pressure. It gets us ready to either attack or to run away. So it raises our blood pressure. Uh, it uh, you know, raises our stress level. It actually even, uh, it, it even begins to reduce our ability to fight off disease. Our immune system is compromised for a time because we're trying to uh, take all of our body's energy and put it towards either fighting or flighting. Flying, I guess. So, so basically, our body re, kind of re- uh, organizes all of our energy, and it, and, it, and it really, it creates stress. Well, that's just in one moment, but if we have unresolved anger and we continually have unforgiveness, it does that over and over and over again. And every time you think about the person that you're angry with, every time you think about what they did to you, every time that you 
you, you, you do that, it, it's this, it has power over you because it does that same thing over and over and over again. And studies have shown that basically uh, harboring grudges, people who, are harboring, uh, who harbor grudges, they basically uh, experience an increased risk of heart disease, of cancer, and stroke by harboring grudges. We also know that uh, increased arousal and stress levels over a period of time uh, they basically, people who do that, a lot of times they turn towards self-medicating through drugs and alcohol, even uh, unhealthy eating habits, which then all of those things create a whole other set of problems that affect our body. So on the face of it, before we even crack open the scriptures, we know that unforgiveness affects us. So we ought to just lay that to rest before we go any further. Um, we know physically unforgiveness, choosing not to forgive, harboring grudges, um, those things, they basically, uh, they affect us in a lot of physical ways. And we haven't even opened the Bible yet. Now, this morning we're going to look at the ways that not only uh, do, does it affect us physically, but, but unforgiveness, choosing not to forgive, affects us spiritually. It affects us emotionally. It affects, us, it affects our witness uh, in the world. So we're going to look this morning at, at, at several scriptures. So be ready to move with me. We're in Matthew chapter 6. Um, that's the first one that we're going to look at. Matthew chapter 6. And it's in the middle of this, this little thing that Christians have called for a long time the Lord's Prayer, right? And it's a pesky little prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, right? Because, you know, you know, a lot of you probably know it. It's, you know, our Father who art in heaven, uh, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us uh, today the bread that we need or give us this day our daily bread. And, and this is the tricky pesky part. And forgive us our trespasses or our debts or our sins, depending on what translation you're looking at. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, right? And, and it's just that one word. If we could just skip that one word, let's just take the word as out of there. Let's just pretend like it's not there um, because that one word tells us something about forgiveness that we really need to hear this morning. Because the word as in this context, it means to the same degree, in the same way. So what we're basically saying every time uh, that we talk about forgiveness, we're basically saying, God, forgive me in the same way or to the same degree that I forgive others. And that word as is just this pesky little word. And so I know if you're one of those folks right now that's really holding tight to issues of, of unforgiveness and, and somebody's deeply hurt you, um, you may just want to just pretend like that's not there, right? Just, 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 just gloss over that. Just take that word as and just cross it right out of your scripture. Because if you, do, if you, if you take that seriously, and I'm being facetious, we ought to take it seriously. If we take that seriously, it means that our choosing not to forgive, one of the ways it affects us is, it's, it is uh, our unforgiveness is holding our own forgiveness for ransom. Unforgiveness holds your own forgiveness hostage or ransom. You know, basically what Jesus is saying is, if you forgive others, so too will your heavenly Father forgive you. I mean, he goes to say that right at the end of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. He says that, uh, he says that again. He says, look, because if you forgive others, your heavenly Father will forgive you. If you don't, he, he also will not forgive you. It's pretty blunt. It's pretty basic, and it's really pesky. So you're going to have to cross that one out of your scriptures too if you don't want to forgive. And, and I'm saying this out of love because I know this is hard. This is not easy for anybody. Forgiveness is a hard thing to give, and yet uh, it does affect us. One of the ways it affects us is it holds at ransom. Jesus tells this great story uh, in Matthew 18. Uh, it's this great parable where a master... Uh, basically uh, comes home and he wants to, uh, he, he's given, he, you know, he's loaned his money out to some of his servants and he's given one of his servants uh, this money. He comes to, comes to make account with all of his servants. This servant comes to him and this servant owe, owes him, uh, basically, if you, if you kind of do the math on it, he owes him uh, for 20 times, I, th I forget the number of talents, I want to say it's a thousand talents, uh, or it's 10,000 talents and he's got and a talent is basically 20 years of an average worker's salary. So he basically owes his master 200,000 days of his, of his salary. Now, this is a big debt that he owes to the master. The master says, hey, I'm, I'm here to collect my debt. And the, the servant throws himself at, at the mercy of his, of his master. And he says, I don't have it. And he begs for mercy and he begs for forgiveness. Please don't throw me into jail until you can collect the debt. And he begs for mercy and forgiveness, and because the master is merciful, he forgives the servant the debt. 
Well, then what happens is that same servant who's just been forgiven 200,000 years worth of, worth of debt, he goes out and he runs into someone who owes him about 100 days worth of debt. And he says to him, pay me what you owe me. And now this time, the friend that he's loaned money to does the exact same thing that he had just done. He throws himself at his feet and he says, have mercy on me. He says, please, have mercy. I can't pay it. And, and the servant, who's just been forgiven 200,000 years worth of debt, says to the one who owes him 100 days worth of debt, no way, I'm not forgiving you. And so he has him thrown into jail. And then, of course, Jesus continues the parable and says, well, the master, who's forgiven the large debt, eventually finds out about that. And when he finds out about it, he's furious. And he eventually takes that servant who was not merciful and he throws him into jail. Uh, he does the same thing to him that the servant had just done to his friend. And, and the basic point there is, you know, God has forgiven us so much. How would we dare not forgive someone else? And I think, I think the root of our unforgiveness, sometimes it goes like this. I think the story that we tell ourselves in our head is that, we, that really God, you know, we're pretty good people. That's what we tell ourselves, right? We're pretty good people, and God hasn't had to forgive us all that much, right? The debt that, the debt that we owe him is, it's not that big, you know? Uh, you know, I'm not a heroin addict. I've never had an affair. I've never, you know, you name out the list of what those things are. And that means that I'm, I'm pretty good. God's forgiven me a little bit. But Jesus makes plain in this parable that, that we're the first servant, that we're the ones that have been forgiven a huge debt before God. I mean, remember, we're racking up. If God is there, if he's uh, taking tallies, which I don't think he does, but if he were, he'd be taking tallies for everything that we think, everything that we do or, left, or leave undone, by the way, and, and, and everything that we say. Thought, word, and deed, right? So if he were taking a tally... You know, that, that time when I see someone in need and I choose not to do anything about it, boom, there goes one. You know, that time when I say that thing that I really shouldn't have said, and, and, uh, but, you know, I just got angry and I said it, oh, there's one. You know, that, that time when I'm thinking thoughts that I clearly should not be thinking, tally, 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 right? And we start, and, and you do that over a period, I'm 42 years old, you do that over a period of 42 years, you start running up some tally marks, right? And don't think it's just me that's doing it. I know you, right? You're all doing it too. Right? And, and so we owe God this huge debt. God is perfect and pure and holy, and we are not. And so, and so we do rack up this huge debt. I don't care how good you are. Mother Teresa owed God a huge debt. Right? I mean, we all fall very short of the perfection and, and, and the purity and the beauty and the holiness of God. And so we owe God this huge debt. And so we, we might hear this story that Jesus tells, and we're so mad at that servant. We're like, servant, why do you do that? You, you owe God... You owed that master so much. Why did you not extend mercy to someone else? But what Jesus is doing is he's turning that parable and he's holding up to us as a mirror. And he's saying, yeah, but, but you do that too. And so this morning, I, just, I think it's important for us to, to realize that, that we are sometimes that servant. We've been forgiven so much. But when somebody, uh, when somebody needs that mercy from us, uh, how, how, would, how would we ever expect for God to forgive us? if we're not willing to extend that same mercy to others. So the first thing that we see this morning in the scriptures is that unforgiveness does affect us, and it, what happens is it holds your own forgiveness ransom. Um, and that's, that's a pretty tough word, but something that's important for us to hear this morning. The second thing uh, I want to lift up this morning that we see in the scriptures is that unforgiveness gives the enemy a foothold in our lives. Unforgiveness gives the enemy a foothold in our lives. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, um, Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, and he basically makes this uh, he makes a statement that he says, look, whatever you guys have forgiven to the church, he says, whatever you guys have forgiven of the people that were causing trouble, whatever you've forgiven, I'm going to forgive it as well. And he says the reason that he does that is so that, in verse 10 and 11, it says, Satan, so that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Now, he doesn't say what he means by that. He doesn't really unpack that. But you can imagine, as he's writing to the church, Paul has some stuff in mind. And don't you imagine it's things like division in the body of Christ. Don't you imagine it's things like uh, harboring resentment and anger uh, and fear-mongering and all the stuff that, that unforgiveness starts to do in us. He says, look, I'm going to forgive the same things that you guys are forgiven because I don't want to give Satan the ability to... Uh, to basically, you know, 
work his schemes here. And then he goes on in, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says the same thing in verses 26 and 27. He tells us, he, he tells us in your anger, do not sin. Which, by the way, just a side note, means anger is okay to do, right? We see Jesus angry. It's okay to be angry. What Paul says is, in your anger, do not sin. And then he goes on and he says, um, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Why? So that the enemy may not get a foothold is basically his point. So what's a foothold? So um, a foothold, think, I, I think about it in terms of rock climbing. Any, anybody like to rock climb in here? All right. So I'm, I'm, I, I don't, I've never rock climbed on a real rock, just in the gyms, you know, and usually with my kids. So I'm pretty lousy at it. But here's what I do know. Uh, what I do know is that if you're going to try to scale even a 20-foot, you know, even a 20-foot uh, rock wall inside of a gym somewhere, you're going to need some footholds. Because the reality is our forearms are not strong enough to pull us up and scale up a mountain or scale up a wall. What we need is we need places where we can put our feet because our legs are stronger than our forearms. And so we, can, we need some handholds too, but we need to be able to put some, have some places where we can put our feet, a foothold. And when we put our feet there, then we push with our feet with our bigger muscles and our legs, and we can scale this wall. Well, that's great in rock climbing. It's great to have a foothold in rock climbing. It's not so great to give the enemy a foothold in your life. Because what that means, I mean, the image that, that came to me was is that, you know, the enemy is trying to scale the walls of our defenses. He's trying to make us into people that we're not. He's trying to uh, harbor uh, anger and resentment and all those things, and he's trying to change us from the inside out. We don't want to give the enemy a foothold, as Paul says in Ephesians 4. And I know that, you know, not everyone has the same concept of what that looks like, right? Some people, you know, think of Satan as this little guy with red, you know, pitchfork and, you know, horns that he has on. And some people think of it as, uh, you know, evil is more of a force. But there's no question that Jesus himself and, uh, and certainly Paul believed that there was something working against us. Something trying to scale the wall. Someone trying to change us from the inside out. And so Paul says, don't let the, your anger, don't let the sun go down in your anger so that you don't let the enemy scale the walls of your heart. You don't let him change you from the inside out. So, so the second way that it affects us is that when we choose not to forgive, what we're basically doing is we're, we're giving the enemy a foothold in our lives. The last thing uh, that I saw this morning uh, uh, in the scriptures that I wanted to lift up to you is that forgiveness, not only does it uh, affect us uh, physically as we talked about, not only does it affect, uh, it allows the enemy a, a foothold in our life, it, it also hurts our witness. Unforgiveness, choosing not to forgive, it hurts our witness. We see that in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 uh, through 48. Do we have that up here? So you've heard it said, you uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? That you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So what, Paul, I mean, what Jesus is saying here in the Sermon on the Mount is, um, you know, I know that everyone else loves their neighbor, the person sitting next to him, the people that they like, and they hate their enemy. But he said, that's not it. That's not what you're supposed to do. As followers of Jesus, he, as followers of mine, Jesus says, you're supposed to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And the reason for that is so that you can show yourself to be a child of God. And then he, li he lays out what God's doing. He says, look, God um, makes the sun shine down on both the righteous and the unrighteous. He makes his he makes rain fall down the fields of the good folks and the bad folks. He says God shows love to people that might be enemies to him or think of themselves as enemies towards him. If God shows that kind of love and you want to say that you're one of his, Jesus says, then you should love your enemies too and pray for those who persecute you. So, so Jesus kind of raises that bar and then he ends that whole, that whole part where he says, um, at, at the very end of this uh, section in Matthew, Matthew 5, he says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And he doesn't mean be perfect like every aspect of your life will be perfect. He's talking about perfect love. He's talking about a love that is, that is bigger and wider than the, than the world's love. He said, I want you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Show yourself to be children of your Father in heaven. See, what happens is when we choose not to forgive, when we choose to forgive, we show ourselves to be children of the Father of our, of our God. When we choose not to forgive, the problem is we do the exact opposite. Right? We end up showing that we're just another one of those Christians 
that bask in the glory and the mercy of God's forgiveness, but we don't want to offer that to anybody else. And I don't know if you've noticed, but the world doesn't need any more of that. They don't need any more people to point at and say, let's not do it like them, right? The number one, some people would say the number one cause of atheism in the world today are, are, is not because people haven't met Christians, it's because they have. It's because they've seen the way that we live. We, we want to be forgiven of this huge debt, but we don't want to offer it to anybody else. It hurts our witness. And so Jesus says, look, you, you, you need to, to, to love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, so you can show yourself to be children of your God. One of the humbling things about being a parent or being really active in the life of a child, if you're an uncle or an aunt or a brother or sister, is that they, they begin, you, you affect them. So like if you were to look at me, so some of you know me well, some of you don't know me well, but if you, were to, if you want to find out something about me, hang out with my kids for a little bit, and they will show you just how weird I am. Um, and now all the good stuff came from Ginger, but the, the other stuff, right, comes, it comes from me. But, I, so, but if you were to hang out with my kids, you'd see some of the weird stuff that we do at home. Like uh, I sing a lot. I just sing random stuff. I'll make up words. I'll take a hymn and I'll change the words. I'll sing, you know, if you say to me, hey, Dad, I'm going to my friend's house, I'll be like, you're going to your friend's house today. You know, I'll just make up some really weird thing. I know it's strange, and I'm confessing I'm vulnerable here, okay, so don't judge me. <laughs> but, but, you know, I'll just, make, I'll just sing some weird stuff in my house, and what's happened is over time, you know what my kids do? I'm telling you, I'm telling on them now. They, they sing weird stuff too. And I think it's really cool. So there's more music in the world because somehow I'm, you know, I'm involved, right? Um, and, they, and they'll sing weird stuff, and, 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 and I think that's pretty cool. My son, Noah, he sneezes really loudly. You know why he does that? I don't know how that works. I don't know how genetically I could have passed that on to him, but he sneezes loud just like his dad. I sneeze really, do, am I telling a lie? No, I, I sneeze really loud, and so does he, Right? Um, I mean, I could tell you that each one of my kids, um, they have different, char- they share different characteristics of Ginger and myself and one another. Um, when you look at my kids, you can see part of me in them. Well, that's, that's the goal. That's what Jesus is saying. We should love, we should forgive, um, we should love our enemies, pray for those who persecute us so that, so that people can see us as the spitting image of God that we were created to be. I know that we're, none of us are perfect, but that's, that's the gold standard, right? Um, if, if we want the world to see how weirdly loving God is, we need to show that weird kind of love in the world that we live in. When we don't do that, it hurts our witness. So unforgiveness affects uh, a lot of things, but one of the things it affects is our witness. I think uh, I, I'll, close, I'll close with this. Um, last week, um, Ginger was taking Noah and Grace to go meet my parents. Uh, after the service, or uh, I mean, after in the afternoon, early afternoon, they were going to Bucky's in Madisonville. I know you know, all know where that is, and so they were going to meet them there. So they left at you know, I don't know, late morning sometime, and you know, two two and a half hours there from here maybe, and then another hour to eat lunch with my parents, and another two to two and a half hours, um, you know, after that. So so I basically uh, I basically you know was here and you know preached, and then we had a meeting afterwards. So I went to that meeting. And I came up here and worked for a while, and I was sitting there at my desk doing a little bit of work, getting a head start on my sermon for this week, because I knew nobody was home, and I realized, wait a second, nobody's home. I was like, I am missing an opportunity here. <laughs> um, because Jenna and Jessica were at their dad's house, and Ginger, Noah was going to my parents, and Ginger and Grace were still driving, and I thought, I am missing an opportunity, so I went home. I went home. I'm just going to enjoy it right now. I'm going to think back. And so I walked in, and there was silence in my home. And I closed the door, and I I locked it. <laughs> and then I, I glided up the stairs to what is supposed to be my TV. They don't know that apparently, but that's supposed to be my TV. And I sat in front of my TV. And I put my hand on the remote control, which I had not really had control over for a long, long time. And I picked it up. And I put it on some mindless something. And then I fell asleep. I took the first nap that I had taken in a really long time without at least a child jumping on me to interrupt it. And I had this moment of peace. And I thought to myself, man, I need to send my kids away more often. (laughs) I'm just kidding. But But I had to enjoy the peace. And the reason I enjoyed it so much 
And I think the reason we all enjoy it when we get it, kids, parents, everybody, we enjoy it when we get it because it's in such, such short supply. And here's the deal. At the end of the day, all of these things here, they all point back to the fact that choosing not to forgive, it robs us of our peace. And peace is in such short supply, why would we do that? Why would we rob ourselves of the few moments of peace and joy that we have by, um, by drinking, as I mentioned last week, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to get hurt, for the other person to get sick. It, that's not how it works, because what happens is every time you think about it, it, again, it affects you physically and mentally and spiritually, it affects your witness, all those things, it begins to rob you of your peace. And you know what they're doing? You know how much you're hurting them? Not at all. They're sitting in Bora Bora on the beach having breakfast, drinking orange juice. And you are the one who is held captive to your own forgiveness. You are the one, and I am the one, who are robbed of our peace. It's just a myth to think that we can choose not to forgive and, and have it not affect us. It does affect us in many, many ways. So my challenge for you, my challenge for myself, is to look at those people in your life. Look at the people from the past who have hurt you, whatever that looks like. And I'm not here to minimize any of that. I mean, we get it. I get it. Forgiveness is hard. But I am so thankful that we serve a God who doesn't say, okay, well, it's hard. Don't worry about it. Don't do it. Or you know what? Um, I'll just look the other way and you just pretend not to do that. No. What he says is, that's all the more reason to forgive. And, and he tells us to do this thing that's really hard for us. We may want the Pop-Tart, but he says, no, we're, you need to hold out for the pizza. He wants, us, he wants better for us than what we even know or want for ourselves. Look at those places where you're still holding on. Your, your, fins, your fists are so clenched that you don't know what to do with yourself. And the only person you're hurting is you. And, and pray and ask and beg God to help you because he knows it's hard too. And begin to let go of those things. Will you pray with me?